week one of the PFT live hiatus coming closer to a conclusion, but it is Thursday, and that means for PFT OT, it's quarter zip black PFT top, the requisite uniform every Thursday when we are on hiatus or when we are not. And let's get to some of the things currently happening in the NFL. Sad news yesterday, specifically as it relates to the Ravens, a current member of the team, Jalen Ferguson, died at the age of 26. We've got stories at the website regarding that tragic situation. No signs of foul play based upon initial reporting from the scene. Just a horrible, horrible situation. A young man in his prime, still on the front end of realizing his potential in the NFL. And he had been incredible at Louisiana Tech. It is sad anytime anyone passes before their time, but it touches us more closely as football fans when it happens to someone who is in that NFL ecosystem. And as always, we extend our deepest condolences to everyone who knew Jalen in any way, shape or form, current teammates, former teammates, coaches, friends, family, et cetera, just a horrible situation. And then Tony Siragusa, who played for a variety of teams, including the Ravens, and won a Super Bowl with Baltimore back in 2000. He passes at the age of 55. He was always that big personality, the funniest guy in the room, did a great job as a sideline reporter and actually an extension of the booth. He was more active than the usual sideline attendant. He was, he was involved. He was in the end zone. He was roaming around. He was just this big bear that kind of did whatever he wanted to do. And it was entertaining and it was informative. And beyond that, he was one hell of a player, uh, intimidating and forceful and, uh, you know, an old school throwback kind of a player, but also a very gregarious personality and gone way too soon at the age of 55. Condolences to his former teammates and coaches and friends and anyone affected by that passing. But we move on to other things that are happening in the NFL. There is no slow time. I just accept it. There is no slow time. Maybe I should lobby to have no hiatus whatsoever for PFT Live because this week especially ended up being very busy. And one of the reasons Wednesday was so busy, the Washington commander's situation makes it to the House Oversight Committee for a full-blown hearing with Roger Goodell participating virtually as a witness. I, I'd love to know more about the negotiations that resulted in Goodell not jumping on a train and going down to DC and being there in person because he's in New York, right? He could have done it. I think that was part of the back and forth, the wink and the nod and the, okay, how about this? How about that? Let's negotiate this. He'll, he'll do it, but he doesn't want to be there in person. It's a different look. It's a different vibe. It's a different feeling when the witness is there in person. And I think it would have been a better and more informative overall presentation if he had been there in person. But one of the things that happened in the aftermath of yesterday's hearing, didn't touch on this yesterday, did a full breakdown yesterday of my impressions of Roger Goodell's testimony from that oversight committee hearing. The commander's management, specifically co-CEOs Daniel and Tanya Snyder and team president Jason Wright, sent a lengthy letter to all employees of the team and also sent it to Shefty, who very dutifully tweeted it to his nine and a half million followers. And it's a continuation of a theme that has bubbled up in recent days from those who are trying to get people to basically give the commanders a break. Hey, don't we get credit for all the changes we've made over the last couple of years. Why do we still get criticized for all the old stuff? Why aren't we getting more praise for everything we've done? Well, look, bottom line is everything you've done has happened under duress. You've done it with a gun to your head. You have to do it or there will be new management. One way or another, there was gonna be improvement in Washington. It was either gonna happen on Daniel Snyder's watch or it was gonna happen with new management. Either way, things were gonna get better. So Snyder did what he had to do. And we still don't know why he had to do it. They always say the punishment fits the crime. We don't know what the crime is. We don't know what it was. We don't know how deep the rabbit hole went. We don't know any of that because the NFL continues to refuse to, to be transparent with what the evidence was, with what the facts showed. And the letter in a couple of different spots, almost tries to make the employees of the team indignant about the criticism that is still lingering for past events. Like it's being directed at them. But those folks are smart enough to know it's not on them. It's on management. It's on ownership. The criticism isn't directed to people who have been hired in the last two years as the franchise tries to pivot toward normalcy. 
It's on the people who presided over the abnormal reality it was the Washington commanders for so many years. So this is just shameful, in my opinion. Using your current employees as human shields to try to deflect criticism, try to end criticism, and get a little pissy about the idea that they're attacking all of us. No, they're not attacking the whole team. They're not attacking the organization top to bottom. It's an attack on the top. And it's a feeling that the consequences have been insufficient because the information on which the consequences have been based remains woefully incomplete. We don't know what was done before the punishment was imposed. If you don't know what was done to justify the punishment, how can you properly gauge whether or not the punishment was proper, whether or not the case should truly be regarded as over? And it is far from over. Remember, Chairperson Carolyn Maloney said Wednesday, Daniel Snyder is going to be getting a subpoena to show up for a deposition. That will be the next very interesting chapter in this unexpected slow time saga that is the Washington commander's investigation that they thought was over and done with last July 1, when they very deftly dropped that news into the perfect slow time five-day window right at the start of a long weekend. And they had gotten through it and it was done. And but for someone weaponizing the John Gruden emails, it never would have become a thing. And, And let me just reiterate this. I know I said it yesterday. Please stop emailing me and tweeting me the why is Congress doing this? Doesn't Congress have better things to do? The NFL has not complained about the scrutiny. The NFL is not saying it should not be regulated by Congress. The NFL has no problem with it. So if the NFL has no problem with it, the rest of us should have no problem with it either. And as I said yesterday, if we are just going to fall back on, well, the times are tough, that gives anyone who should be held accountable for their conduct a pass. Well, we can't scrutinize this person who did something they shouldn't have done because you know what? Gas prices are high. So we better just give them a pass. Does that make sense? And there's always going to be something that we can point to. Well, gas prices are high. Well, milk's high. Well, we can't get baby formula. Well, we can't do this. We, don't, we shouldn't be doing this. Come on. Come on. We're smarter than that. And our politicians are better than that, or at least they should be. And if they aren't, we should replace them with others who are. Deshaun Watson for a change, no developments on Wednesday, quiet on Wednesday, but you never know what's going to happen next. And let's just kind of reset where it is as we move forward, because we are undoubtedly, folks, creeping closer toward the moment at which the NFL announces something. And I think the biggest practical impact of what happened on Tuesday with 20 of 24 cases tentatively settled, and it's just a matter of time before the paperwork is filed. It's not done until it's done, though. It's not officially settled, but it's moving in that direction. The biggest takeaway in my mind is it reduces significantly any lingering possibility of paid leave, because I felt like it was all moving toward a critical mass that was going to require paid leave for Deshaun Watson. 24 cases, two more to be filed, maybe more to come. The HBO feature, the New York Times article, the Rusty Harden attempt to normalize the happy ending at the conclusion of a massage. It just felt like we were getting to the point where the only way the NFL could handle this is to say to Deshaun Watson, you go away with pay until you get these cases resolved, and then we'll figure out where we go from here. I think that now with only four cases left, and unless there's a new avalanche of cases that will be filed in the immediate future, I assume that paid leave is back to being off the table if it was ever even back on, because remember, the commissioner took it off the table in March. Now the question is, what will they do by way of an unpaid leave? And the settlements change nothing. The NFL still has to make a proposal of the duration of a suspension. Former Judge Sue L. Robinson, independently paid and retained by the NFL and the NFLPA, will decide what to do with that proposed suspension. All of it, some of it, none at all. And unless there's no discipline whatsoever imposed by Judge Robinson, that's when the commissioner comes in with the appeal jurisdiction. And and I could see kind of a ping pong match where the NFL says full season. Judge Robinson says eight games. Roger Goodell on appeal says 12 games. That's how it could play out. Kind of a back and forth and an end result that's kind of like landing the plane in the midpoint of what everyone wants. And uh, we'll see how that plays out. But that's going to be a big fight, too, because remember, the union is going to point to three owners, Daniel Snyder, Robert Kraft and Jerry Jones, 
punishment they either didn't get or not significant punishment enough in comparison to Deshaun Watson, because the argument will be that the punishment must be proportional and the personal conduct policy says in very plain terms, owners are held to a higher standard. That was a question not directly related to Deshaun Watson, but that was a question that was brought up yesterday to Commissioner Goodell. So we continue to monitor Deshaun Watson and we'll be ready to go. We'll be ready to mobilize with posts at PFT, breaking down every angle of whatever may happen next and also reacting here on PFT OT, or as the case may be, PFT double OT. I'm taping this at around 11 a.m. on Thursday, fully aware of the possibility that we'll be reconvening based upon whatever crazy thing may happen as this Thursday, supposedly slow Thursday, unfolds. DeAndre Hopkins, Cardinals receiver, who's suspended for the six games that start the 2022 regular season, speaking out about the situation, expressing hope, that they'll figure out why he tested positive and also an aspiration that maybe the NFL will reduce his punishment if they can prove what happened. None of that's going to occur. It's the nature of the policy. You test positive for anything, you're suspended six games. No questions asked. Strict liability, meaning there's no intent involved. It doesn't matter if you meant to cheat. If you have something in your system, no matter how it got there, you test positive for one of the banned substances under the PED policy, you're suspended six games, period. So none of this matters. It's just noise. And if anything, it's PR damage control. And as I've said time and again, almost everybody who gets busted under the PED policy for a positive result says, I don't know what happened. I didn't intentionally take it. And maybe they're all telling the truth. And I'm not saying DeAndre Hopkins isn't. It's unfortunate if he is, because surely at some point over the years, somebody wasn't, because nobody ever gets caught cheating. That's the great tragedy of the PED policy. With very, very few exceptions, the policy has never ensnared anyone who was trying to cheat the game by using banned substances aimed at giving them an unfair edge over the competitors on the field and the competitors on the depth chart. Not only does it give you an edge against your opponent that you are engaged in physical contact with, it gives you an edge over that teammate that maybe is more deserving to be starting, but you're holding it all together by using these banned substances. That's why the rule's in place. And it's unfortunate that it is set up this way because we never really know who was cheating. And I don't know that you could prove that someone was intentionally cheating. That's why they have strict liability. That's why they have this standard. No matter what, you're out. They don't have to prove intent because everybody would say, I didn't mean to do it. And you can't prove that I did. And then it becomes some big mess of trying to find witnesses and proof and just make it strict liability. That's what it is. Back to my original point. That's why nothing DeAndre Hopkins says at this point matters from the standpoint of his suspension. It's not getting reduced. The only question is preserving his image in the eyes of fans, sponsors, teams, et cetera. His legacy, is he viewed as a cheater? Or is he viewed as a guy that just wrong place, wrong time, wrong substance spiked into the right supplement or whatever it was that he took that somehow got this in there? And and I've joked in the past, and it's not really a joke, it's serious. I mean, somebody could sprinkle something on your food at a restaurant and you could test positive. If somebody really wanted to get you, you go out to a restaurant, you order a salad, and they sprinkle some PEDs on there. You test positive, and you have no idea. It potentially could happen. That's why it's very important for every NFL player to be extra vigilant about anything and everything that gets into his system because he is responsible. There should be no doubt. And with each passing example of a guy who says, how did I get suspended? I didn't intentionally cheat. Oh, it doesn't matter. Every other player should be on clear notice that you are responsible for what's in your system and it doesn't matter whether you meant to cheat or not. Last topic before we take a look at whatever questions may be lurking around on Twitter. And and I think this is a great story. I saw something recently about Chris Henry Jr. getting an offer from Ohio State. And then I saw yesterday Kevin Clark of The Ringer tweeting a photo of Chris Henry Jr. with Pac-Man Jones at the University of Miami It turns out Chris Henry Jr. is only 14. He's already got a long list of offers, college scholarships. And I saw a clip of him at a West Virginia University camp. I know why he's got all those offers. 
looks like he'd step in right now and play major college football. And he's 14. He's going to be a freshman in high school this year. He won't be in college until 2026, for crying out loud. But he looks a lot like his father. A former teammate, D. Alston, who helped coach Chris Henry Jr. in Cincinnati, says, I have to do a double take from time to time. Looks like him, acts like him, plays like him. It's a great story. And to have Pac-Man Jones, who's adopted both Chris Henry Jr. and his younger brother, Demarcus, who's just one year behind in the pipeline. It's, it's just a great story. It was a tragic ending for Chris Henry Jr. He, he, or Chris Henry Sr., excuse me. He died in 2009. His career in the NFL was, was punctuated with a suspension under the personal conduct policy. Pac-Man Jones was suspended for a full year. Henry was suspended for half a year. They were part of the effort by the commissioner to beef up the personal conduct policy. But it sure looks like there's a happy ending floating around here for the Henry family. And by all appearances, Chris Henry Jr. is on track to be a great player, great person, being mentored by Pac-Man Jones, who has turned his life around as he has matured. It's just something to keep an eye on. And, and it's going to make the process of just watching the career of Chris Henry Jr. more fulfilling as he goes through high school, goes to college, and inevitably ends up, I think, in the National Football League doing justice to his father's legacy. And, and look, Chris never became what he could have become in the NFL for a variety of reasons. Knee injury at the tail end of the 2005 season, his rookie year, uh, the suspension in 2007, untimely passing, obviously in 2009, but maybe Chris Henry Jr. can, can get to the NFL and be everything that his dad was supposed to be. One hell of a story. Uh, and we're rooting for that to happen. All right, let's take a look. And what we have today in the Twitter bag, let me queue up the phone here, refresh. Neil Watch's PFT has several questions. Let me start here. Uh, Stan Kroenke has won the NFL, is about to win the H NHL, and had Jamal Murray stayed healthy at the end of the season, could have contended for the NBA title. Where would you rank him in the owner's power rankings? That's hard to do without doing the full rankings from top to bottom. And also, it depends on who you ask. If you ask people in St. Louis, I know where he'd be ranked. If you ask people in L.A., he'd be ranked slightly higher. So I don't, I don't want to just throw a dart and pick a number because it's all something that needs to be done in relation to all NFL owners. And I've thought about maybe like ranking the top 10. But you know what? I, I just don't want the extra headache because what will happen is if I say I'm going to do it, I will undoubtedly be lobbied by PR people to include certain owners because they are as petty as the rest of us, which is kind of refreshing. Even when you have billions, you still become very petty about what people say about you and where they rank you on these lists and, you know, Google in your own name and all that crap. Uh, and also I'll get complaints after the fact from people who are upset that they weren't, weren't ranked higher than they should have been or weren't on the list at all. So I'm probably not going to do that. And I, I'm just not going to throw a dart on Stan Kroenke. But again, ask the people in St. Louis what they think about Stan Kroenke. Another one from Neil Watch's PFT. If Deshaun Watson wanted to get back a version of his life closer to his life prior to these allegations, what would he need to do to regain a good public image? I don't know that he can ever get back to where he was. It's about what he could have done from the get-go, and we've talked about that. Settle the case, first case before it was ever filed. Settle any other cases before they're ever filed, if there are other cases. There may have never been other cases if they hadn't pissed off Tony Busby by refusing to make an offer when he requested $100,000 to settle the Ashley Solis claim before the first lawsuit was filed. I don't know what he can do at this point other than, end this now, serve your suspension, come back and play and play well. And then the passage of time and the reality that there will be other controversies, other events, other things that we talk about and think about and write about, we will eventually forget about Deshaun Watson. There will be something else that is our focal point of the day. It happened with Ben Roethlisberger. It happened with Mike Vick. Things get either forgotten or not as vividly remembered. And I remember when Ben Roethlisberger, with two allegations, was the biggest story in the NFL, and he never had protracted litigation that commanded a ton of attention with 20 plus accusers. He only had two. He got suspended. He served his time. He came back. They went to the Super Bowl. Within a year or two, it was completely forgotten. And by the time he retired, if he even mentioned it, you were kind of regarded as a jerk. 
Don't mention that. That was a long time ago. Well, it's still part of his story. We're trying to reflect on the career of Ben Roethlisberger. And I think it's amazing the redemption he achieved in Pittsburgh, because back in 2010, when all of this was coming to a head, I remember listening via uh, online to Pittsburgh Sports Radio. It was just one person after another calling in with some random complaint about Ben Roethlisberger, how he was rude to the person here, cut in line at the Subway uh, restaurant, whatever it was. It was just like all these ridiculously trivial complaints, but they, they, they were thinking about trading him. They almost traded him. Uh, it, it, was, it was a huge mess, and he turned it around by winning, by winning and by staying out of trouble. So that's how Deshaun Watson maybe won't erase these issues, but how he at least can get past it. Resolve the cases, serve the suspension, play good football, win games, and stay out of trouble. Five years from now or sooner, there'll be a much different vibe around Deshaun Watson than there currently is. Thanks, thank God for Neil Watch's PFT, unless there's a ton of questions here, but he's got several, so that's keeping us going today. Do you think the oversight committee will do anything at the end of the day, or do you think the whole purpose of that hearing was grandstanding? Well, I, I think it's both. And it is political theater. It's performance art to a certain extent. It's depressing to watch. That's how our sausage gets made as a government. But at the same time, there are two bills that are being introduced to address some of the problems that have come to light by virtue of the commander's investigation. So I think something will be done. I think Snyder is going to get subpoenaed because they said they're going to subpoena him. And when he testifies, who knows what the end result of that is going to be? Who knows if he's going to face some allegation that he lied to Congress or committed perjury? Who knows? So there's still plenty of steps left before we get to the bottom of this. And the reality is they have until November, December, January, when the new, assuming that the Republicans retake control of the House and then retake control of all of the committees and the plug gets pulled immediately on whatever is left of this commander's investigation, the clock is ticking toward the point at which the Democrats will no longer be able to set the agenda and determine who gets investigated and who doesn't. And, and look, it's not a political comment. I mean, it's political because it's recognizing political realities. I'm in favor of the commanders being investigated and scrutinized here because there, there seems to be no other path for getting to the truth. And it's too easy for the NFL to brush it under the rug. That was one of the things that was said yesterday by multiple members of the committee. We shouldn't care about this because the NFL took care of it. The question is, did they really take care of it? Did they properly take care of it? Is it enough to brush it all under the rug and say, we're not telling you anything? We don't have to. We're a private business. It is a very public private business. Just because it isn't publicly traded, it is a public business. It relies on the money, the attention, and the time of the public. Not to mention public dollars for stadiums. Not to mention the broadcast antitrust exemption. It is a key part of our public life. And as I've said, and I'm repeating myself, but I don't care. It's an important point. Nothing else brings together millions of people for a three-hour chunk like the National Football League and a live game. So uh, I think this is going to keep going, at least until the new Congress is seated. <laughs> Neil says, this is not a question. I know a lot of us are still hoping for PFT zip-ups. Maybe someday. This is the only one. This is the prototype. Prototype that never went anywhere. So as long as it holds us together, I'm going to keep wearing it. Maybe we will find a way to make some more. One more from Neil before we move on. Do you have any big plans for the remainder of the hiatus? Well, first of all, it really hasn't felt like a hiatus. I mean, I was busier yesterday than I ever am, other than during football season, with the commander situation, with all of the posts we did on that, with the video that we did, and radio appearances and podcasts. And that's fine. You got to take your news when you find it. We don't make the stories. The stories make us. Got to cover it. Got to cover it like we always cover it with candor and with transparency and with an effort to help people understand exactly what is going on in the National Football League. And I think most people out there understand what we do, how we do it and appreciate it. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to hang out. I'm going to try to enjoy myself. I got some other stuff I'm working on. I'm just going to relax as best I can, read some books and uh, wait for July 25 when we can get back to doing PFT Live two hours a day, every day, seven to nine Eastern on Peacock and Sirius XM. 85. All right. What else do we have? 
Maximus Overdrive. What can we expect to hear from Daniel Snyder next week? What happens if he doesn't show? Is that even a possibility? Um, if he gets subpoenaed and he doesn't show up, he's got a problem. He potentially gets arrested. So I'll be surprised if it happens next week. I don't even know if they can make service. I, I joked about that yesterday. He's in France. I don't know what the rules are for serving a subpoena from Congress in France. But one way or the other, they'll get him subpoenaed and he'll have to testify. And when he does, you can tell the truth and face the consequences or you can not tell the truth and face the consequences. But it will be and could be and should be very interesting when it happens. Ian Forrester, given how much the Broncos sold for recently, does this make the slim chance of any non-USA franchise even slimmer than it is now? I, I, don't, I don't know that that affects the possibility of a team being in another country. I don't. It's just going to be expensive for whoever buys a franchise. If it's an expansion team, it's going to be very expensive. The price is going to keep going up and up and up. And as we reported, Josh Harris would have paid $5 billion for the Broncos if he knew that would have delivered the team. When he was unable to get an assurance that $5 billion would get it done, he decided not to put $5 billion on the table because he knew he was going to be jumped by the Walmart group that would have offered well over $5 billion to get the team. As it stands, 4.65, but the numbers keep going up. And I, I still think eventually, especially when slash if, when the NFL expands, we'll see a team in London or two, two. Two stadiums, two teams, just like Al Michael said years ago, when the NFL returns to LA, it'll be two teams, not one. And he was right on the money, even though it was a year apart, it was two teams and it'll be two teams in London. If that ever happens, what else do we have? Uh, James Hannon, when's big cat back? Uh, well, you know, I think we reached out to him. There was a day not that long ago where we had a hole. Cause I think when the Sims went to Cincinnati to interview burrow and he wasn't available, I, look, he's busy. He's busy. He's big time. And I don't mean that in a pejorative way, like, oh, he's big time in me, but you know, the guy's busy. Uh, he, he will show up from time to time. Hopefully we'll get him back at some point on a Friday when Peter King's not available. But the usual schedule is Chris Sims Monday through Thursday with Peter King on Friday. Now, last year, Sims was off on Mondays. We had Mike Goldick instead because Sims does that postgame show on Peacock. So I don't know what's going to happen this season. But either way, you got to deal with me two hours a day every weekday on Peacock unless I get sick 10 minutes into the show and have to bail. <laughs> that's that's uh, I don't even remember when that was. Isn't it weird how our days kind of blend from one to the next? And and just like with, you know, we're talking about earlier Deshaun Watson and memories fade. Memories do fade like that was a bad day. I was miserable that day. And I can't even remember when it was. It was a Thursday, though. I I, I think I was where I, I don't know. I don't think I, I don't think I had the patience to find this one. I think I just grabbed a different quarter zip. But that was a bad day. This is a better day. It would be even better if we had PFT Live, but the next best thing is PFT OT. Thanks, as always, for joining us here, and we'll still be available around the clock at profootballtalk.com all day, every day, hashtag no days off. Thanks again for your support, and we'll do this again tomorrow. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.